If you join the right OSO, you should want to hug the BD person who worked with you. You shouldn't be angry at them. And I can safely say that when we were done with our negotiation, I was so thankful for you, Michael, and for other people who helped. And I think, again, if you're getting to a position where it's an adversarial relationship where you don't want to see them again, oof, that's not something I'm used to. Hello there, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Orthopreneurs Podcast. Today, you're going to get a great master class in something that I think has lots of misconceptions, lots of misinformation out there. And today, we're going to set the truth straight for everybody. Uh, we're going to make it clear what is the best hockey team in North... No, I'm kidding. We're not talking hockey. <laughs> but today, I've got Michael Crosby uh, from Smile Doctors. And, and this guy is arguably, in my opinion one of the most knowledgeable people you will ever meet when it comes to understanding the nuts and bolts behind private equity acquisition of practices and private equity backed orthodontic companies in general. And so today you're going to get a chance to be part of a conversation that he and I will have like the countless number of conversations we've had in the past that have helped educate me. And so welcome, Michael. I'm really thrilled to have you here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Glenn. I think podcast numero uno f for me. So we'll see how how this goes. I've been uh, looking forward to the conversation, Glenn. I think again back to what you said. A lot of you know my conversations um, with orthodontists across the country are always about what does partnership look like, and, and really trying to get down to you know having an informed decision about what's out there. And there are a lot of great choices. So I look forward to the conversation. And for everybody out there, just so you all understand, full disclosure, I joined Smile Doctors in October 21 with my partner, Douglas Shaw, and I love it, and it's been great, and I highly recommend it to anybody out there looking, but I want to be clear that while we will talk about some things related to Smile Doctors, because there's some great lessons that were learned that were ultimately, in my opinion, applied by almost every OSO across the board, when, when Smile Doctors learned it, everybody else took suit. But we're going to talk about broad concepts related to all the things related to uh, acquisitions of practices by OSOs, DSOs, because today you're going to have insight with a friend, Michael, who really understands this stuff well. And, and it's going to be like you're sitting at a barbecue having a conversation about these sorts of things. So don't think that this is a Smile Doctor Orama podcast today. We're going to certainly talk about Smile Doctors at some point, but we're also going to talk about the bigger, broader picture. So with that in mind, Michael, do me a favor, if you don't mind, and take a, just a few seconds to let people know, how did you end up doing what you're doing and what is your technical title? Yep. So I'm the chief development officer of Smile Doctors. Um, I've been with the company now for a little over five years. I joke with our CEO, Jay Hedrick, it feels like 15, um, <laughs> but it's been an awesome ride. I came from um, broader kind of healthcare M&A before Smile Doctors. I worked with a large a uh, hospital-based system here out of Nashville, Tennessee, also where our BD office is now for Smile Doctors. And for those of you out there, I'm going to translate every now and then. BD means business development. There you go. They, they good, do this a lot. Translation, Glenn. There's a yep. lot of acronyms that these people use. So yep. I'm going to be a translator. I speak BD beautifully. So BD is business development, which is just another term for growing your company. Good, good call, Glenn. Um, yeah, so it's been a few years, a company called LifePoint Health, um, here in Nashville, Tennessee, and worked on physician practice acquisitions. Um, before that, worked with a uh, another private equity-backed company in the oncology space named E Plus Cancer Care. Um, spent about six or seven years there and um, have really kind of grown up within the finance world, kind of cutting my teeth on mergers and acquisitions. So it's been, in my mind, kind of a well-rounded group of doctors, I would say, you know, cover your ears, Glenn, a little bit, but orthodontists are by far the most fun um, of, of all the different kind of specialties that I've worked across. So Smile Doctors, again, has, has been an amazing ride. Um, when I first looked at joining, I spoke with Dana Fender, who I know you know well, Glenn. Love anybody who's um, met Dana Fender loves Dana Fender. Yeah. So he, he's a mentor of mine. I still talk to him on a probably daily basis, but uh, spoke with him and, and really at the beginning, kind of laughed at the idea of, of working only in orthodontics. I didn't know the size of the specialty. I didn't understand the runway ahead and kind of what's out there in terms of possibilities and um, consolidation in the space. So 
It took me, you know, only a few conversations to meet him, to meet Dr. Scott Wall, um, another founder of Smile Doctors, to spend time at, you know, the headquarters there in Texas, meet the people behind it, and again, see the opportunity. And from there, it's just been um, kind of a roller coaster ride, but also a rocket ship of, of growth that we've been on. So it's been an amazing journey for sure. Well, it, you were instrumental in our joining. Uh, you, you know, I think what's important to mention out there is that, you know, there's not just one person working business development. There's a whole team of people. I'm here to attest that they all work really hard um, on behalf of the doctors as well as on behalf of the company. Uh, it's not an adversarial relationship for everybody out there to understand. Um, in my opinion, you don't have to respond. If you join the right OSO, when you join, you should want to hug the BD person who worked with you. You shouldn't be angry at them. And I can safely say that we, when we were done with our negotiation, I was so thankful for you, Michael, and for other people who helped. And I think, again, if you're getting to a position where it's an adversarial relationship where you don't want to see them again, ooh, that's not something I'm used to. And so there's a bunch of people who do this. Um, Michael was instrumental in mine. And uh, it's just been a fun ride watching what's happened since, since that time. And so let's start here. Let's talk a little bit about private equity. Just a few seconds, nothing big. Let's assume that somebody listening out there knows what an OSO is, but doesn't really understand what is private equity. Yeah, I think from, you know, 2,000 foot view, 30,000 foot view, not 2,000. 2,000. Uh, we know, we know 2,000 as well. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a form of financing in the private markets, right? So the way that I describe it in, in every dinner that we go to with doctors, right? One of the first questions is, what is private equity? And so, you know, I like to show this kind of stair-step approach of you have different sizes, right? You have you, small cap, you have mid cap, and you have very large private equity firms that are out there. And the goal of the private equity firm is to be an investment and growth vehicle for that should be already kind of mature business. So it isn't venture capital in the sense that it's just an idea and a startup and a thought. This is an established platform that you know likely has some profitability, some solid revenue to invest behind. They believe in the management team at this point. They believe in, in the growth strategy and, and what's out there. And so, again, the goal of that private equity group is to continue to invest over, you know, a four to five year period to grow the company and then kind of move it to the next higher level, more capitalized private equity firm that can kind of take the investment from there. So not sure if that hits it exactly, but um, ho hopefully, again, 30,000 foot view. No, that was great. But private equity, essentially... It's money from private investors pooled together for certain resources and investment in companies that have a track record. Like Jeremy Krell from um, Revere Partners, his venture capital has been on the show. And you know, I think it would be fair to say that private equity looks at past performance, whereas venture capital looks at future, right? Because there is no past. Yeah, fair point. One of the big questions people ask me all the time is, Glenn, why do you always talk about these three to five year timelines, right? Because Anybody who's involved in private equity on any level knows that, you know, uh, it's not uncommon for people in private equity to say, look at a range of equity turns, right? You're looking every three to five years, maybe at a three to four times return or two and a half to four and a half, whatever you want to put there. But but we always talk about it in terms of three to five years. And you, you alluded to it a little bit that, you know, you might have a private equity backed company that manages a company and then... Three to five years later, there's an exit. There's a there's a purchase by a bigger company. Can you explain why that happens? What's yeah, yeah what's I going think, on, I and why is it three to five years? Yeah, well, I think it's twofold, and I think you know if if I'm an orthodontist thinking about it, and I think as as orthodontists look at projections and what a potential kind of total valuation can look like, you know, frankly, it, it takes a company that is capable of of you know, generating a return in that time frame for the math, usually to make a lot of sense for, for that kind of partnering doctor. So I think from a doctor's standpoint, you know, it's very important to understand, as you said, past performance of those companies to, to understand and believe in a legitimate pathway to a, to a solid return. So I think 
from the doctor side, it has to make sense in that type of timeline. For the private equity investor, you know, I, I can't answer for 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 Lyndon and TH Lee, who's our um, you know private equity sponsors, but I think it, it's a similar type uh, equation for them, right? That you know, it's it's enough of a window that. Um, allows for significant growth and upside, but not so much that it's tied into a you know long-term investment. And I think some of the horror stories that are out there, and and you know rightfully so, some of the concerns that orthodontists likely have are around you know how do I get my equity out, right? How do I um, how does this turn into real cash and not just a number on a piece of paper? And so. Again, to me, that's the timeline it takes to, to make sense for both the investor side, but also um, for the for the doctor side. Yeah, and and every private equity company has a portfolio based upon certain size companies. So as a company gets larger, let's take Smile Doctors for instance. How many doctors do we have in Smile Doctors right now who are partner doctors? Yeah, just north of three hundred. I think it'll change on Friday. I'll go up a few, but. Uh, just th- call it 300 plus doctors, and then right around 415 locations um, in 28 states as of today. So, so let's say we have, you have 300 doctors. When Smile Doctors started, it didn't have 300 doctors, and there's a completely different management style. There's a completely different set of concerns, I assume, as a company. And so, the private equity company that owns or plays a role in a 300 doctor billions of dollar dollar valuation company is a very different private equity company than the one who started when Scott Law and Dana Fender and you know got started with with Smile Doctors back in the day. And so I, that kind of explains why there are these things called equity transactions or whatever you want to call them. There's bunches of different names. But that's why it happens because there's a handoff, right? From one private equity company says, okay, we took you from a, I'm just making this up, we took you from a $10 million company to a $50 million company, right? We managed you. We helped you grow. Now somebody else is going to take you from 50 to $200 million. And then somebody took it from 200 right? Because different size private equity companies have different strengths and abilities, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Great description. Okay. So when people hear that, one of the things that they may not understand is the equity in the company. And I, I think it's too big and broad of a topic to dive into very deeply because every, not every, but many companies have different equity structures, right? And we're not going to, I don't want to dive into that now because I think it's too complicated to get into. But at its essence, equity from private equity, right? I feel like uh, Eddie Murphy and, and Dan Aykroyd from Trading Places when he goes bacon, like you might find in a uh-huh. bacon, lettuce, and tomato sandwich, right? But equity, like you find in private equity, is how companies make money. And it's also something that allows doctors to get a little piece of the pie, right? So at its basic level, how does a doctor win when a company wins? I know it's a broad question, but let's just say I join private equity, I join Smile Doctors, and my overall deal is X million dollars. And of that, um, 0.1X of that, you know, 10% or 20% or whatever, whatever it is, is in equity. What does that really mean to me down the road? Yeah, I think in you know in simplistic terms, and I'll quote uh, Dr. Jared Zwick, who helps lead the development team with me on this one. He Great always, guy. If you haven't met Jared out there, you should. Amazing dude. Thrilled to have him as one of the leaders on our team. Yeah, he always uses the example of. Are you um, going to give me know, a football example? Yeah, football example. I'll, I'll move it to a. To I'm a kidding. Leader. Jared is a Division example. One quarterback, folks. So yeah. there's a lot of football examples. Yeah, um, but but we always talk about. I mean, what you're essentially doing is shifting ownership in your private practice into having a stake in a much larger company. And so again, he right. uses the analogy of kind of owning a grape versus a, a smaller piece of a watermelon. And That's so right. the con- so the concept and what where equity, you know growth comes into play is as the company's watermelon grows, right? And your stake, which may be, it is a smaller stake than owning a hundred percent of your, your, your private entity before that growth becomes magnified when you start to integrate it into a larger platform, right? So as you create, you know, whether it be economies of scale or you take best practices from 
you know, people like Ben Fishbein, Amanda Gallagher, Dan Bills, list goes on and on of kind of how we tap into and help grow practices. Or, you know, it could just be how, how can we help make the lives of, of team members better, right? We have benefit plans and bonus platforms that will help them as well. All, all things that as the individual practice grows, it's helping expand and grow that watermelon. So as, as that watermelon is kind of hits full size and maturity, um, the equity value of those individual shareholders also goes up. It's a great analogy. I love it. And I you know, can't take credit. I can't take credit for it. So we'll uh, make sure to to tag Jared to that one. Well, we just did. You know, and, you and when when I did my transaction, it was made clear to me by my attorney at the time that the equity you you paid long term capital gains, not ordinary income. Why? Because you're trading the shares in Krieger Orthodontics for shares in Smile Doctors, or or the equity, the cash, whatever I had in Krieger Orthodontics was no longer Krieger Orthodontics. It was part of Smile Doctors in cash, and so. Um, I, I love the way that's explained because now when you just told me that we're closing some deals on Friday, hopefully, I feel amazing about that. Why? Because my network is getting larger. Our value is growing. And I think it's worth mentioning one more time that the way companies grow, doesn't matter who you are, the strength of a private equity company should grow, if I'm not mistaken, based on acquisition of new comp of new acquisition of doctors, right? Acquiring practices and internal efficiencies, right? So if you have a, a hundred doctors who are all doing, say, Invisalign, and they're paying $1,500 each, if you can get a corporate deal at $1,000 each, boy, you just made some real gains from an efficiency perspective. Yeah. And that's just one very small piece of the pie. Yeah, right? I actually think that's a huge point, Glenn. I mean, the, the inorganic kind of base business growth to me is the most important aspect of, of partnership. I mean, you can acquire as many practices as you want. But if there is an inability to, to bring those on and not take practices backwards, um, it, or you're not able to, to help grow, you know, that that kind of top line production, then that investment, as, as many practices as you can partner with, still continues to decline. So I think, um, again, that that's a huge point. And, and as, as I kind of compare the landscape Again, a lot of great groups out there. Um, that's a key facet, I think, in, in determining kind of who to partner with. I agree. Whoever you're joining out there, you know, they better have a plan and a way to help you grow. Because if they acquire you for $10 million and five years later you're worth $10 million, that's a problem. All right. And, and again, because the next private equity company that comes along, they're not going to pay, overpay what you're worth, just like nobody should overpay for your practice. And I know we've talked about this next topic a bunch, but I, I've been privy and lucky enough to be involved with so many doctors out there who've reached out to me because they know I've really studied this. And they've said, hey, Glenn, I'm thinking of joining a group and I find out details. And, I, and I've seen cases where, as a metaphor, you got a car that's worth $5,000. The car is worth five grand. It's a used car. Everybody knows it's worth five grand. You got one buyer comes and offers you 5,100. You got another buyer comes and offers you 4,900. And then somebody steps in and offers you $5,800 for the car. And I've always said to them, something, if something doesn't make sense, there's something not right there. And so what is the, and I've seen people chase the money and sometimes it's not worked out so well. What is the downside of a, a private equity backed company that's that's making a deal that's consistently paying more than what anybody else is paying. And I, again, I can't, no names come to mind here, but I've seen more than a few cases where someone said, I'm speaking to three companies, two gave me X, the third one gave me 20% higher. And I'm sitting there going, why? Why? Your EBITDA is not changing. And they can value it slightly differently. I get it. But what happens long term if a company is consistently overpaying for practices yeah, that's it's acquiring? Great question. I mean, and, and a loaded question because it I is. know because I know I, everyone, I, yeah, I've everyone, been there when you've drawn a line in the sand yeah. and you said we cannot afford responsibly to pay more for this practice than we are paying right now. Yeah, and and, and for us, it comes down to being disciplined, right? So think about it in terms of. Any investment that you do, there is point, and, and that inflection point could be different for different companies. But point being, again, 
having a disciplined approach is what creates the value for the shareholders. If, if, you know, we were out there overpaying, I, I wouldn't even call it overpaying. It's, you know, anybody that lives in their own house thinks it's worth more than the next buyer does. Right. And so yeah. again, to quote kind of the great Dana Fender and what, how he's kind of mentored me through smile doctors, there's, there's a point that, you know, for really great practices, we're going to be a little uncomfortable moving up from where we are. And the orthodontist is going to be a little uncomfortable from coming down to where they are. But I think that's kind of the magic overlap of what creates a really good partnership. And that's, that's my job. That's my team's job to help figure out, you know, does the math not only work for our side, but it also obviously has to work for the doctor. And so when, when we look at, you know, we'll look at a hundred, you know, I don't know, 200, 300 valuations a year, a lot of those will, will you know, probably recommend that the doctor not move forward. So it, it's not something that there's a there's a price for everything. I mean, it truly is about, um, it sounds cliche, but it truly is about finding the right partners. You know, always another cheesy quote that I throw in. I always talk about getting married is easy and staying married is hard. And so we focus on staying married not just the number of getting married. And, you know, as you, uh, you know, as you move through the closing, right. And, and the valuation that occurs then what really makes it something that um, was a great experience or not, I think comes down to the success of integration, the ability to deliver on, you know, the promises and expectations that were put out there, whether that be, kind of equity return, right? Whether it be how your team will, will take this and how we'll support them or how we're going to partner with your marketing team to continue doing the great things that you're doing or not changing your brand or supporting the fact that you use American mini twin brackets, whatever it is. Right. Um, that's what that's what's creating long lasting partnerships with Smile Doctors is um you know, being very transparent, very honest, and and proving out the overall equation makes sense over time. Yeah, and, and the one thing we, you know, you said a bunch of really good things there. The one thing we didn't talk about is, again, if you're consistently, if your company is consistently overpaying for practices, then when the time comes later on, and I know you don't want to use the word overpaying, I'm going to use the word overpaying, but if you're consistently overpaying for practices, when the time comes that the next private equity company is stepping in, the long-term success is decreased. You're not, if you're looking at getting, great, you got paid out, it's amazing. You made more money than you should have, but your equity is not gonna get paid the way it should have because they're gonna look at the balance sheet and go, wait a minute, you paid out last year $100 million in practices that you should have paid 85 million on, right? And just the value isn't there. That was one thing that you mentioned that I just wanted to sort of touch on just for a second, because I think it's important to discuss that. Yeah. And I want to be clear to everybody out there, there are going to be things I might talk about with Michael that he just can't discuss, right? Any different than, you know, your practice. You know, if I'm sitting at a dinner party and I ask you, you know, how much did you take home last year? Not a question you're going to be comfortable sharing in public, right? You might say privately to somebody, but you probably wouldn't do it on a podcast. And so if I ask Michael a question that he can't talk about, understand that. So I'm going to touch the first one. It's a possibility. For doctors who aren't ready to partner yet or think they're not ready to partner yet, and I was one of them, my partner, Doug, and I, we had a plan. Our plan was going to have us working another three to four years, building it sort of like the Fishbine model, really try to get up into those numbers and then partner with somebody. But the deals were, were better than we expected, and I encourage everybody out there, no matter where you are, if this is something that appeals to you down the road, definitely speak to the OSOs and get a valuation and and learn what you're worth the same way you tell your patients, make every decision with all the information in front of you. If a person walked in and said, you know, I just decided I don't want braces. I, I just don't think that they work. You'd be like, time out. I got to give you some information here. And all too often I hear people say, well, I don't think OSOs are for me. And I'm like, do you know what you're worth? Do you know what your life will be? Do you know what's going to happen after you know you integrate with them? Autonomy, things like that. So first thing, I want everybody out there listening, if you're considering it, you might be ready now and you might grow faster as your share of the watermelon, as Michael talked about, than you would grow as a grape on your own. It's a possibility. But if I said to you, Michael, that 
you know what? I'm growing 25% per year. My practice is blowing up. Can I somehow leverage that in a way that allows me to partake in some of that while I, I see the part of my watermelon growing as well? Yeah, no, it's it's a question I can answer, Glenn. So absolutely. I just um, want to and, be- and what comes to mind, let me hit, hit this in two parts. I think first part being, you know, you're you guys, you and Doug are a great example. A lot of the partnerships that that we do every year start with a conversation with an amazing practice that says, you know, there's like a 1% chance I would ever do this. And anytime an orthodontist says there's a 1% chance, like, again, sounds a little, little cliche or cheesy, but that You're is saying exactly, I got a shot. Th- no, it's exactly, it's exactly who we want on our team. So the reason it's a 1% in their mind is because they don't believe. And I, I think a lot of it initially becomes, you know, comes out of misinformation is they don't believe the math will make sense and they don't believe we can continue to deliver the same level of um, culture and autonomy that they have in their private practice. And as we dig deeper into the economics, right, um, we have to prove both sides of the coin. We have to prove that the economics makes sense and we have to prove that we can help you know, maintain everything that's made their practice so great, which is usually, you know, an orthodontic practice, it's going to be culture and autonomy of that doctor. So as we start to peel back the onion and um, chip away at a lot of, you know, misconceptions of, oh, you know, you're going to change our branding. No, we're not. We haven't done that in four years. Or And, and, and in fairness, that was a great lesson that Smile Doctors learned that pretty much the entire industry later adopted was that doing branding was not necessarily the greatest idea at the time, right? The reason we are where we are is because we've made a lot of mistakes and we'll be, you know, we're the first ones to say that. But what makes us who we are is we learn from it. And and that is that is 100 percent. If we wouldn't have learned, we would never gotten to to the position that we're in or, or or have the partners that we do. And so, again, first thing is back to the one percent. I always you know, I would say nine times out of 10, there are a lot of misconceptions around why it wouldn't make sense that aren't reality. So uncovering that reality is a a big part of it. And then secondly, you know, not to go too, too in depth on kind of deal structure format or any of that, but we have a lot of optionality, whether it be, you know, joint venture transactions or, building in growth targets for de novos that were just opened a year ago, right? Where, again, I agree on the opposite side that the math would have to make sense or there's no reason, uh, you know, a young growing orthodontist w- would ever um, look to do this. So, yeah, I, you know, it's hard to say one off, but I always have the same level of encouragement of, you um, Take a look. We don't spend a lot of time, you know, we don't waste time going through the process either. Glenn, I think that's one of the big, you know, tips of the cap to to the team here in Nashville is that, you know, we spend morning, afternoon, night, and weekends making sure, you know, when an orthodontist sends over information, we're gonna we're gonna flip it and get back to them as soon as possible. So we don't spend weeks, you know, kind of deliberating over and um, positioning over a conversation. Right. And by the way, you said joint venture. I just want to expand on that a little bit. What he was referring to when he said joint venture is exactly what it sounds like, but you may not know the term. It means that you have the opportunity for them to traditionally, you'd buy a hundred percent of someone's practice, but joint venture means that, you know, they don't buy a hundred percent. They're going to take a controlling interest over 50% because you out there, folks listening would never buy a company uh, for a lot of money that you didn't have some degree of say over, but but it allows the doctor to maintain some ownership and some profitability from it so that if you're growing at 25% a year and say, you know what, I want to get some equity in the game because I know that's going to grow and I want to be part of a bigger um, uh, company and I want to be with 300 other doctors and learn best practices and I want to grow my practice at the same time, but I want to keep 25% of my practice or 30% or some number that's agreed upon between you and the company, great. You can take home a salary and take home money from your practice as it grows. And you're using the economies of scale 
and you're using the best practices to take what would have been 20% growth and maybe make it 30% growth. And so the joint venture model works really well. It's a newer concept uh, in the OSO world, but I know some people who've done it who have been thrilled they did it. Um, and I just wanted to explain that when you, when you talked about that uh, a little bit earlier. What are some of, the, some of the misconceptions, other misconceptions you can throw out there? Anything else you wanted to throw out that, 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 that people don't understand? Yeah, I think we've hit on a few of them, right? Whether it be kind of branding, marketing, um, clinical autonomy, you know, the way we describe it is freedom within a framework. So it is, you know, we are not the company that says we are not going to change anything. If we were doing that, we would not be creating any value. And and I think that to me, it's an important distinction to, to understand when someone says, we're not going to change anything versus we're going to protect what's important in your practice. Um, and so the first part of our process is understanding what that means to the orthodontist. And so for Glenn Krieger, it may mean, you know, if we stripped away the podcast, you know, there's no way he's going to do it. So we're going to protect Glenn's podcast and make right. sure he can still do that. Or if it's, you know, go down the list of, of things that make the culture of the practice special and make the doctor um, motivated and engaged in orthodontics, right? So it's identifying those things. If if an orthodontist came back and said, you know, there, but there are some non-negotiables, right? Like we do have to take over payroll. We do eventually get to one common platform of a practice management system. Now we don't do it overnight. It's a 12 to 24 month process. And so it isn't flipped. The, the switch isn't flipped overnight. Um, but there are some non-negotiables that those things that are outside of the framework that we do have to pull inside are value adds that are what creates the larger kind of growth of that watermelon. So um, again, not to get down into the, the analogies too much, but I think it's important again to really understand the difference. I think people hear the word corporate and it's like a four letter word, right? But if you ask, um, or, or if I ask, I, I do it on every call, like what does autonomy mean to you, Glenn? I'll ask you right now, just on the spot, like what is autonomy for you? And for me, autonomy just means the ability to show up and be able to shape the culture and the outcomes of my practice without anybody telling me how to do it. Yeah. So, so, so that like going into that conversation, we know, you know, if you said, Hey, like I'm passionate about doing HR and I'll never hand that over, or I'll never get off of X, Y, and Z pra practice management that, you know, we'd say, look, we may not be the best fit and that's fine. But again, I think what I've broadly seen is that there's a lot of misinformation about what partnership and integration looks like. And so, um, and again, I just, all I reference is, uh, you know, the, the locker room of, of who's partnered with us. And I think if you go down the list um, and, and we encourage everybody out there to call any doctor, you know, it's, there are a lot of awesome, big reputation practices, but there's also another 90, 95% of one, two doc locations that are absolutely killing it. That, um, you know, as you really start to right. see who's a part of Smile Doctors, I think that's what sets us apart um, is 100% the, the people that have, have joined. And I think, it, you know, if there were bad experiences, if, if nothing that I said was true, then none of those people would have joined. So... I'll just say this. There have been people who've approached me um, to be part of Smile Doctors. Some I wish would be my partners, but they might be in a state that we're currently not in. Um, and there have been people who come to me where I would never want to be their partner, right? People tend to forget there's so much more than just money. Like I, I, I lecture a lot to residents and I tell them, don't worry about money because you're going to have more money than you know what to do with in your lifetime if you're smart. And I think, again, it's human nature. I was no different with negotiation. Every penny matters. But I, I want to tell people out there as we wind this down, I want people out there to give some thought to the fact that when a company makes a statement like, we've never been through an equity transaction before, so we're going to get 6x, 7x, 9x. Nobody, and again, I'm not going to quote you. I'm going to quote my cousin 
who started his own private equity fund in Hamburg, Germany. And he told me when I went through this, nobody knows the details of any private equity transaction until they're in that private equity transaction, right? Nobody knows. So when people out there say, in my opinion, not yours necessarily, irresponsibly, oh, you want to come with us, this young group, because we're going to make sure you get a huge return. Our equity turns are going to be crazy. First of all, I would run if anybody makes that promise to you, because they have no idea what they're saying. Number two, I've seen certain companies actually walk back those statements uh, over time where they said a year and a half, two years ago, it was going to be X. And then all of a sudden that number changed. I'm like, well, what about all the people who joined when you said that number? So again, I think it's important, but take the money out of it and think about what your life is going to be after you close, because you're going to have a contract and you're going to have to work for at least three to five years, minimum, if not longer, hopefully. And in doing so, you'd better love your post-transition life. And would you agree with me, Michael, that anybody who's ever come into the network, come into the partnership, and has been through the onboarding with Greg Goggins, Dr. Greg Goggins and his team, at that moment is remarkably thankful that they did what they did. Would you disagree yeah, with that? I mean, they are the secret sauce of, of Smile Doctors. And so um, they make business development look good and 100%. I mean, that is the uh, number one uh, kind of rave of orthodontists out there is that team. So 100%. Yeah. And I will say this, if your team thanks you every day uh, after you close, like mine did for six weeks, I would have people coming up to me afterwards saying, thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Krieger, because of this or because now I have somebody helping me with marketing, or now I've got somebody helping me with uh, HR, or now I have somebody who's paying the bills, or now I got support institutionally to help with case accept. Like They came up to me every day for six weeks. No matter what company or what who you join, if they're not saying that to you after you close, there may be an issue there. And so again, we could go on for days, you and I talking about private equity. Is there anything I missed that you wanted to talk about? Well, only other thing that kind of comes to mind. Uh -oh. is, Here it's all coming. I'm, He's smirking. Something's all coming. All I'm thinking about is, is what comes on every conversation, which is, is Smile Doctors too big? I hear and that I think, all the time. And so, so that is one that I was going to kind of end on a little bit because, sure. you know, we're, we're, we're and, and I would ask the question too, but again, I think it, it comes down to having um, to getting informed on on what it means to be too big, right? If if the industry is only ten percent consolidated, and I hate to use all these fancy private equity buzzwords. And by the way, ten percent consolidated is is it ten percent? By the way, I eight to twelve. I mean, we can go. Okay. Uh, Nobody shut, knows. Yeah, but it's, it's a, but for, for everybody out there, consolidation means. I'm going to translate again. Consolidation means what percentage of all the orthodontic practices out there are now part of some organized group? Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, most would agree across healthcare that it will eventually get to where general dentistry is, which is, you know, 35 north of that per, percent. Um, right. You know, when you look at it in that lens, we are tiny. And that would be kind of my last message to to everyone listening, you know, Smile Doctors is just now getting started. Um, and our eyes were very young, very hungry. And I think, again, would love to talk with anyone out there who, um, you know, wants to understand what it looks like. And so uh, I think the size thing is important, but important to understand where the future is. And there is, it is very, very early stage, um, you know, not only for other companies, but also us. And, and, and folks out there, I've become friends with Michael. I really respect him a huge amount. Uh, he's somebody I really look up to. He's taught me a huge amount about private equity. And a lot of what I know comes from him. And I just want to be clear that he just literally said on the podcast that size matters. He literally, those words <laughs> came out of his mouth. And that's what he said. Yeah. But, but I, I, I do want to add to that just a couple of quick things, if it's okay. When it comes to private equity backed, when we joined two years ago, I think people were up, kind of up in the air like, is this a fad? Is this something, and again, this isn't just smile doctors. This is all private equity, uh, OSOs, DSOs. You know, only the big companies are joining, only the big practices are joining, only the big names, and, you know, it's going to fizzle out. And, you know, you always have your Tiggers and your Eeyores. I've always been a Tigger. I'm always positive. I'm always upbeat. I'm always like, we're going to do this. We can, come on, folks, let's go get this. 
but there's a lot of Eeyores out there. And sometimes the Eeyore voices are a lot louder and they try to tell everybody this is going away. Um, it's all going to fail. And I think right now at 10% or so consolidation, it's very safe to say, and if you speak to people I respect, like Chris Benson out there, right? He really understands this market really well. And I don't want to put words in Chris's mouth, but many people will say that this is here to stay. It's not going away. And um, the practices that are joining are not just quote unquote rock star practices. You know, if you're a practice that you're a young practitioner and you're working out of North Dakota or South Dakota um, and you're killing it and you're doing a great practice, this might be for you. And if you're working, you know, in Florida or Texas, you know, or any number of places, you could be rural, you could be urban, you could be suburban. It doesn't matter. I would encourage you that if this idea appeals to you in any way, definitely, definitely reach out to somebody. And again, um, Michael Crosby is somebody who I will tell you now is as honest as a day is long. If he doesn't think it's a good fit, he and, and somebody else on the business development team will tell you this isn't a good fit or don't go to anybody because you're not ready for it yet or come back in a year. They're always going to be really honest with you because it's in their best interest to only bring people in when it's the right time for them. And if they bring you in and it's another four years until you hit your stride, that doesn't help anybody. So again, it's really important. Reach out to my Michael. If they want to get a hold of you, what's the best way? Uh, email's fine. It's just uh, my first name, Michael, and then dot Crespi, which is uh, a funny last name, but K R U S P E. S is in Sam, P is in Patrick, E is in Edward at smiledoctors.com. Or they can text you, Glenn, and, and you can text me. So yeah, it's uh, Michael. Whatever. Michael dot Crusby, K R U S P E at smiledoctors.com. You got it. And, and again, anybody wants to reach out to me, I will connect you to Michael uh, or somebody on the business development team. And again, we'll close with this. When you're one of the bigger players, you have the right and ability to be more selective. And so not every person who reaches out for a whole variety of reasons is going to be a good fit, but they'll always be honest with you and you won't know until you find out. And so Definitely um, reach out to Michael, reach out to me. I'll connect you. And uh, again, maybe one day you'll be my partner. And that'd be kind of cool. Um, I've met some great people along the way. I've learned some great things. And I'm really enjoying watching this whole thing grow. Nobody knows where it's headed. Uh, but it's been a fun ride so far. And I'm really looking forward to the next few years, especially by your side, Michael. So thank you. Awesome. Man. Thank you so much, Glenn, for having me. It was a, um, actually, I, I was... Uh, a little nervous for the podcast, but uh, very appreciative of the opportunity. So thank you so much. My pleasure. You know, you're such a wealth of information. You're such an honest guy that I knew there'd be no issue. And uh, and again, like many people who come on this podcast who've never done it before, there's this great uncertainty of what's going to happen. And I can tell you now for sure, there's somebody out there listening right now in whose life you've made a difference, Michael. And for me, that's what it's all about. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for doing something that may not have been as comfortable as you wanted it to be. Awesome, yeah. Thank you, Glenn.